All right, Zero Trust Basics. Zero Trust is a cybersecurity paradigm focused on resource protection and the premise that trust is never granted implicitly, but must be continually evaluated. Ah, this is me being a grammar Nazi here, forgive me. This should not say but, it should either be a um, period, and then it says a trust must be continually evaluated. That would be a really sweet short sentence to put in there. Um, because saying but makes it seem like ZT is supposed to focus on resource protection. This focus starts with the idea that you never should grant trust implicitly, right? It should be explicit. You know exactly who um, you're trusting and it must be continually evaluated. That would be a really good uh, sentence. I don't know if I should send that to him. Let me at least copy it. All right, Zero Trust Architecture is an end-to-end -end approach to enterprise resource and data security that encompasses identity, person, and non-person en entities. Right, we should be able to identify uh, devices too. It also encompasses credentials, access management, operations, endpoints, hosting environments, and the interconnecting infrastructure. The initial focus should be on restricting resources to those with the need to access and grant only the minimum privileges read, write, delete, needed to perform the mission. Traditionally, agencies and enterprise networks in general have focused on perimeter defense and authentication uh, and authenticated subjects are given authorized access to a broad collection of resources once on the internal network. As a result, unauthorized lateral movement within the environment has been one of the biggest challenges for federal agencies. That I did not know. The TIC and agency perimeter firewalls provide strong internet gateways. This helps block attackers from the internet, but the TICs and perimeter firewalls are less useful for detecting and blocking attacks from inside the network and cannot protect subjects outside of the enterprise uh, perimeter. We're talking remote workers, cloud-based services, edge devices, etc. Okay, so there's our note. TIC and firewalls, protected protection limited to outside the network, um, here they go on to say an operative definition of zero trust and zero trust architecture is as follows. And at this point, if you saw part one of the video, this is really redundant. An enterprise decides to adopt zero trust as its core strategy and generate a zero trust architecture as a plan developed with zero trust principles. The plan is deployed to produce a zero trust environment for use. All right, so it's sounding like zero trust is a strategy. Zero trust is an environment. Zero trust is not a one thing, one time thing you can do uh, to cover yourself and your organization. Here they'll go ahead and justify uh, writing the definition in the way they do. This paragraph really doesn't say anything. Oh, I love pictures. It says in the abstract motto of access shown in figure one, a subject needs access to an enterprise resource. Access is granted through a policy decision point, PDP, and corresponding policy enforcement point. PEP. When I saw the acronym PDP, though, how many of you out there thought of these uh, PDPs? <laughs> At least that's what comes to my mind first. So you know what? I like to write those questions on acronyms. What does PDP and PEP stand for? And I imagine PDP, like a PDF, would be the name of maybe a document. The, the access being granted um, for this person or this device is here in this document called a PDP maybe. Well, here in the diagram, we got our computer policy decision enforcement point PDP, PDP, okay. And then here's an implicit trust zone where there's resources, systems, data, or application. Over here is the untrusted zone. All right, so you have to go from here into here to come out the other end to get to your resources. I don't know why they're calling that area implicit. It says the system must ensure that the subject is authentic and the request is valid. The PDP PEP passes proper judgment to allow the subject to access the resource. This implies that zero trust applies to two basic areas, authentication and authorization. What is the level of confidence about the subject's identity for this unique request? What is the level of confidence? Um, is the access to the resource allowable given the level of confidence in the subject's identity? Does the device used for the request have the proper security posture? Are there other factors that should be considered and the change the and that change the confidence level? So time, location of subject. Oh, time's a good one, right? 
Maybe this resource is not supposed to be accessed at 1 or 2 a.m. I don't know. Uh, location of subject. Subject security posture. Overall, enterprises need to develop and maintain dynamic risk-based policies for resource access and set up a system to ensure that these policies are enforced correctly and consistently for individual resource access requests. This means that an enterprise should not rely on implied trustworthiness wherein if the subject has met a base authentication level, for example, logging into an asset, all subsequent resource requests are assumed to be equally valid. I wonder if SharePoint counts as a way to establish a bit of a zero trust architecture. Well, they say the implicit zone represents an area where all the entities are trusted to at least the level of the last PDP, PEP gateway. For example, considering the passenger screening model in an airport. Okay, consider that model. All passengers pass through the airport security checkpoint to access the boarding gates. The passengers, airport employees, aircraft crew, etc., mill about in the terminal area, and all the individuals are considered trusted. In this model, the implicit trust zone is the boarding area. Okay, that makes sense. So the PDP PEP applies a set of controls so that all the traffic beyond that point has a common level of trust. This cannot apply additional policies. The PDP PEP cannot apply additional policies beyond its location in the flow of traffic to allow the PDP PEP to be as specific as possible. The implicit trust zone must be as small as possible. Zero Trust provides a set of principles and concepts around moving the PDPs, uh, PEPs closer to the resource. The idea is to explicitly authenticate and authorize all subjects, assets, and workflows that make up that enterprise. Well, the thing about that is, don't you have to also show your ticket at um, the boarding gate to get on? That little ticket is an extra little step. Maybe because it's not a good one for security, it doesn't count. Maybe I'm taking the analogy too far. Okay, so the question is, what's a good analogy for the implicit zone of trust? Basically, either use the airport one or come up with another one on your own. Many definitions and discussions of ZT stress the concept of removing wide area perimeter defenses, enterprise firewall, as a factor. However, most of these definitions continue to define themselves in relation to perimeters in some way, such as micro-segmentation or micro-perimeters. Um, see section 3.1. As part of the functional capabilities of a ZTA, the following is an attempt to define ZT and ZTA in terms of basic tenants that should be involved rather than what is excluded. These tenants are the ideal goal, though it must be acknowledged that not all the tenants may be fully implemented in their purest form for a given strategy. So here we are, a zero trust architecture is designed and deployed with difference with adherence, sorry, adherence to the following basic tenets. So number one, all data sources and computing services are considered resources. All right, so if you want to read the details, there they are, but that's simple enough. Um, number two, all communication is secured regardless of network location. I think they have really beat that into our heads by now. Number three, access to individual enterprise resources is granted on a per session basis. That's kind of new and I like it. Number four, access to resources is determined by dynamic policy, including the observable state of client identity, application service, and the requesting access, and may include other behavioral and environmental attributes. So to summarize, TODR, access to resources is determined by dynamic policy. So how do you create a dynamic policy? Here's a good sentence. Requesting asset state can include device characteristics such as software versions installed, network location, <laughs> after they beat it into us that it can't involve this. Okay, I get it. It's just one part of many other parts. Okay, so we have requesting an, ax an asset state can have software versions as an element, network location, time, date of the request, Previously observed behavior? Hmm, that, oh, we could really go into that one, and I like it. But let's push on in case I'm, my mind is taking us somewhere that it's not supposed to be going. The last one is uh, installed credentials. Okay, behavioral attributes. Cool, they're getting into it right away. Behavioral attributes include, but not limited to, automated subject analytics. 
subject analytics, device analytics, and measured deviations from observed observed usage patterns. That is so cool. All right, so good question and answer session right there. Policy is set is the set of access rules based on attributes that an organization assigns to a subject, data asset, or application. Environmental attributes may include such factors as requester, network location, time, reported active attacks. Okay, that's a good one. These rules and attributes are based on the needs of the business process. Okay, very important, right? So this is based on business needs, which is including an evaluation of right here, the acceptable level of risk that business is willing to take. Resource access and active permission policies can vary based on the sensitivity of the resource and data, and least privilege principles are applied to restrict both visibility and accessibility. Now, number five here says the enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. So continuous monitoring is such a thing, and they're throwing in measuring here as well. It looks like this paragraph will touch on that continuous di diagnostics and mitigation, CDM. So either that or a similar system to monitor the state of devices and applications. Okay, so it's not just monitoring, but it's also applying patches and fixes as needed. Assets that are discovered to be subverted have known vulnerabilities and or are not managed by the enterprise. They may need to be treated differently including denial of all connections to enterprise resources, then devices owned by an associated enterprise, okay, that are deemed to have the most secure state. Um, that is such a rough sentence right there. And I think it's really just common sense, so I'm not even gonna revisit it. The last sentence is right here, just reiterating <laughs> robust monitoring, I suppose. Well, we have two more. Um, number six, all resource authentication and authorization are dynamic and strictly enforced before access is allowed. So we got down here identity credential and access management, ICAM, and ac asset management systems in place. This includes the use of multi-factor authentication for access to some or all of the enterprise resources. Continual monitoring with uh, possible reauthentication and reauthorization occurs throughout user transactions as defined and enforced by policy. Well, our last one, and we'll end the video here, is uh, the enterprise collects as much information as possible about the current state of assets, network infrastructure, and communications, and uses it to improve its security posture. That totally makes sense. An enterprise should collect data. Good data analytics will help them sort through all that madness. And here they say this data can be used to provide context for ac access requests from the subjects. So this paragraph basically says, uh, you should do all the things we said above. <laughs> and with that, in part three, I'll go ahead and go over a zero trust, a zero trust view of a network.